Hello, physics students, and welcome to our video that is going to be about the causes of circular motion. And in this video, we're going to look at the force that maintains circular motion. We're going to look at how we describe the motion of a rotating system, and we're going to look at U Newton's universal law of gravitation. So let's start by looking at the force that maintains circular motion. To review, Let's say that we have a ball with some mass and it is being swung around um, in a horizontal circular path and it is moving at a constant speed. It's moving at a constant speed, but its velocity vector is constantly changing because it's constantly changing direction. So the ball is experiencing centripetal acceleration directed toward the center of that circle. This acceleration is called centripetal acceleration, and it is defined as this equation, uh, just as we learned in our last video. We also know that the inertia of this ball tends to maintain the ball's motion in a straight line. It is, in fact, the string that counteracts that tendency because it makes the ball follow a circular path. So the string is exerting a force on this ball that is directed toward the center of the circle. Uh, we can use Newton's second law to describe that relationship. And in this equation, the force is the centripetal force, mass times centripetal acceleration. Now we can do something here as well. We know that centripetal acceleration equals this term. So we can substitute that term into our equation and we get the equation on the next page. And voila, here we have that formula. The force that maintains circular motion is equal to mass times the tangential velocity squared divided by r, the distance to the axis. We can also look at this in another way because we know that tangential velocity equals the distance from the axis, r times uh, omega, which is the angular speed. We can substitute um, this right here into our equation for our tangential velocity. And uh, when we do a little reducing, we can see that when we just plug through the math here, um, this would be r squared omega squared. Uh, that would give us that. The uh, r cancels out one of these r's and we end up with the force that maintains circular motion being equal to the mass times the distance to the axis times the angular speed squared. So this force is no different than any other force we've been talking about. It's measured in newtons. Um, an example of this force would be the gravitational force exerted on the moon by Earth. Um, that is providing the necessary force to keep the moon in its orbit. Now let's work through a sample problem uh, with our new knowledge of the force. Let's say a pilot is flying a cute little ultralight plane at 30 meters per second in a circular path. And that path has a radius of 100 meters and a force of 1350 newtons is needed to maintain the pilot's circular motion. What is the mass of the pilot and the ultralight? First I'm going to write down what I know. I know my tangential velocity um, that's given to me. I know the radius of the circular path, and I know the force needed to maintain uh, circular motion. So now, what equation will I use? Here's the equation I will use. Um, I am also asked to find the mass. So I'm going to now uh, plug the appropriate values into my equation. Here are the appropriate values, and I'm going to solve for the mass here, m. When I solve for that, I get 150 kilograms. When I look back at my problem, however, I can see that I can have three significant figures. Uh, so I need to write this in three significant figures, and in order to do that, I can convert that into scientific notation. And that will then designate my three significant figures, and I know that my plane and my pilot, 
It's 150 kilograms. So this force directed toward the center is absolutely imperative for circular motion. To illustrate why this is so, let's think about, again, our, a ball on a string. Here's the person's hand, here's the string, here's the ball, and it is being swung around vertically this time, rather than horizontal. So it's being swung around up and down and around in a circle. If that string were to break at some point, our force directed toward the center vanishes. We no longer have that force, and the ball uh, will begin to move along a straight line path that is tangent to the circle. In this case, the ball would be moving along, this, uh, along a parabola and would eventually then uh, hit the ground at some point moving along that parabola. If our ball, uh, or if we had a ball right at this point and the string broke at this point um, during the ball's path around that circle, we are losing our force directed toward the center uh, when the ball is here, and its path would be then going straight up, tangent to that circle, and it would assume um, a, the motion of a free-falling body. So let's take a look at another situation. Let's say you go to the grocery store and get some bags of groceries and put those in the back of your car here, and you are driving about, and you are entering a curved portion of the road like this, and as you're driving, uh, you begin to turn, but those groceries are going to uh, tend to move along the original straight line path. That's in accordance with Newton's first law. Um, objects in motion stay in motion. They travel in that direction that they are traveling. However, if there is a large enough force that maintains circular motion that will act on those groceries in the back of the car, uh, then the groceries move along a circular path right along with the car. So what is the origin of that force that maintains circular motion? It could be the force of friction between the, the bottom of the bags of the groceries and the top of the car seat, or the bottom of the bag of the groceries and the top of the carpet on the floor, or the little rubber mat that you have on the floor. If that frictional force is not sufficient, your groceries slide across the car. As the car turns, they will continue in their straight line motion. Um, because of inertia, those groceries want to keep moving in a straight line. So if enough friction is not applied, that's what they will do. So inertia is not a force. Um, people oftentimes get this idea a little bit confused. It is simply what objects do. They tend to stay in motion. So unless a force is applied to them, a force that is directed toward the center, a force that makes circular motion happen, um, then if that is not happening, inertia will take hold and things will travel in that nice straight line. Uh, sometimes the word centrifugal force is thrown around. This is actually not a force. The force is what is maintaining the circular motion. Now let's take a look at gravitational force. We've talked about this before in previous units, um, but gravitational force is also one of the forces that maintains circular motion. Uh, it keeps the moon orbiting around um, the Earth or the Earth orbiting around the sun. And if you'll remember, um, gravitational force definitely depends on the mass of the two objects as well as the distance between them. G is equal to 6.673 times 10 to the negative 11th Newton meter squared per kilogram squared. It is called the constant of universal gravitation. It's been determined experimentally and this is what its value is. Um, this equation also is an example of what we call an inverse square law because the force varies as the inverse square of the distance between the objects. So um, that means that um, between these objects, when the distance between them increases, the force greatly diminishes because that is an inverse square law. 
So let's do a, an example problem together. Find the distance between a 0 0.300 kilogram billiard ball and a 0 0.400 kilogram billiard ball. If the magnitude of the gravitational force is 8.92 times 10 to the negative 11th newtons. Well, let's write down what we know. Let's say uh, the mass of that first ball is 0 0.300 kilograms, and the mass of the second ball is the larger one. We also know the gravitational force, and we are asked to find the distance between uh, the two balls, r. Remember, r is the, the distance between the two uh, from the center of the spherical mass to the center of the other spherical mass. Now, let's write down the equation that we'll be using. Here's Newton's universal law of gravitation, and we can simply plug values in uh, for where we need to and solve for r. Here we can substitute uh, the values in. We have the uh, force of gravity here. We have uh, the g constant here that is the same uh, no matter what. Uh, here we have mass 1 times mass 2 divided by r squared. And we can now solve for r squared algebraically, simply multiply both sides by r squared, um, and then divide both sides by the force of gravity, and then take the square root of both sides, and that will give us 3.00 times 10 to the negative 1 meters, or 0 0.300 meters. Here are some advanced ideas. Other ideas could include the conceptual challenge on page 262 of your textbook, um, but look at black holes, uh, do some research on your own, or if you've got other ideas as well, please bring them in. I look forward to seeing you in class.